I think. Yeah. Not an awful lot of deep love for one another. Uh, and after somebody who's worked for Argos, as I haven't explained about in my book, you know, yeah. managers at senior level, the, the, the difference is vast, you know. The Argos, the secular world was friendly, welcoming, encouraging, supportive. General Synod seems anything but that. And and I wonder if you feel it's fit for purpose or whether or, or not. No, I mean, I, I've always said that, that I've always joked that I have a group of friends who should have a contract taken out on my life if I ever end up on General Synod, because it would be a kind of mercy killing. Yeah, so um, St. Charles in the Fields is confused with um, St. Martin's in the Fields. Um, and we're not St. Martin's in the Fields. St. Martin's in the Fields is the very big church here in the centre or just to the side of the National Gallery in um, Trafalgar Square. Um, uh, I remember getting quite an irate telephone call off a, um, a, a woman who was standing outside St. Giles. I uh, said, um, I've come for the, the uh, Vivaldi concert, but it's not on today. Um, <laughs> the church is dark and no one's here. I said, well, are you, are you sure you're at the right uh, church? She said, yeah, I'm standing outside your church now i said well um we don't ever do Vivaldi concerts and hate Vivaldi as it happens but um she said oh well uh i said are you sure you don't mean some artists in the field she was like well that one and i said well a project and they sent me this pack with all these stats in it and it said that 38 percent of the uk population had um a, either a serious illness or long-term disability and I remember I read that one Saturday afternoon and then the Sunday morning I was standing at the back of church and I was thinking, well, 38% of these people aren't. So where are they? And the truth is that the majority of disabled and seriously ill people no longer come to church. So that's, you know, we were talking earlier about Christian Aid Week and... Uh, the importance of people fundraising for us, but we talk about the kind of three kind of ways in which uh, the public in Britain can support our work. And we talk about people giving, acting and praying. Um, so absolutely, we need people to fund our work, but we want people to take action with us and use their voice. And we want people to pray for our work and pray for the communities we're working with. Um, and uh, we do believe that, uh, you know, prayer can have a transformational effect. So that kind of trinity of give, act and pray um, uh, I hope your listeners will um, uh, kind of take that away from this conversation. Yeah, and and, and I, I would absolutely concur with that. You know, the power of prayer. Oh, I love comedy. I do love it. But at the same time, you know, I, t I teach screenwriting at a university and I'm, I'm tr I've got a couple of a drama script in development. And, you know, we're speaking about this. I don't know when this is going to sort of be going out or indeed when people listen to it, because people listen back to these things much later. But in the wake of the, the post office drama on ITV at the minute, and we're seeing before our very eyes, the power of a really, really good drama to create empathy in people mm. and to actually get behind the story a bit. And and now, of course, there's all this head scratching going on like, but why was no one talking about this earlier? And the media going, we were talking about it earlier. Why are politi politicians only choosing to act now? Well, because suddenly there's this groundswell of millions of people watching the show and really feeling for these people's lives in a different way nation of women and the remarriaging of divorced couples is this because is this simply about sex that's the problem mm. i think you've probably hit the proverbial nail on the head i think there's some deep deep rooted um issues around shame around discomfort with I don't know what it is. I don't want to over sort of psychologically analyze it, but I do think that if you strip away the layers of of how people use and misuse um, biblical texts over this, how people use and misuse words like doctrine and theology to sort of cloak what is, I think, just pure homophobia or transphobia. And that's, you know, these things need to be named and called out because they are simply not biblical they're not of god that's not about god's kingdom that's not about the flourishing of people it's about a a very deep rooted almost hatred towards difference or how that's then threatening people's own sense of 
masculinity or or whatever. It's just there are some real deep rooted human issues going on there that I think end up being the things that then drive how the church responds and then again drives how we just seem to be hell bent on delaying things and not providing clarity. Back to that word clarity that we said earlier. Yeah, it's not hard. But but I I, I think from the outside lots of us are just sitting here watching going, why are you still together? It's like watching a marriage of a couple who absolutely hate each other but are staying together for the kids and they and even but the kids have grown up and left uh, because you know the the age demographic isn't there anymore and the kids are like well, we don't care like we know you hate each other why are you still married like separate um I, I find it particularly interesting of course that the church of england was established based on a an issue of marriage and 400 years later is still having an argument about an issue of marriage um but but i think most of us are from the outside would just be like you 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 can hold this together but i would argue that those who are on the more conservative side don't actually want to hold it together mm. they want you to think what they think that's um, the point that is the point yeah. Andy. that's it right there you know those awkward christians for this generation and maybe that's what we're called to be it's not comfortable for us either um but maybe maybe that's why i'm here i'm never sure why god called me to the church really it all seemed like a very strange idea but you know that's god's fault I think a lot of us, a lot of priests think like that, actually. <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, a few weeks ago, I was in a meeting. Uh, Charlie Ware, a conservative evangelical, said he was he was embarrassed to be part of the Church of England, which saddened me greatly. Um, I wonder what you think, you know, if, if the church does move forward and, and if ultimately becomes um, more inclusive, but the conservative wing of the church moves away is that a price worth paying well i don't think it has to happen i think it's a choice um and we've heard a lot about people breaking away which feels to me to be often sitting in the realm of threat rather than in the realm of wanting to have a constructive conversation um at the moment the reality is that for many conservative evangelicals there is a refusal to compromise whatsoever uh, and even the idea of compromise is itself a compromise. Um, and so uh, in a sense, if if people are unable to live in a church where 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 there are differences of opinions that are being honestly expressed, well, I, I'm not sure how we can call ourselves a church at that point, that the work's already done there. Um, we already disagree. You know, there is there is I don't I don't want to get into a, a, a difficult conversation, but. Uh, the Mike uh, Pivolacci revelations uh, raised concerns about safeguarding, particularly with young people. Yeah. Um, it, is is that revelation in some ways a good thing because it brings everything out into the open and it makes us more um, uh, careful, makes us more professional, makes the conduct better, or is it just a uh, another kick in the teeth in in the in the in the hope for youth ministry? Oh, yeah, it is a difficult question. And I, I was quite close to that situation in lots of ways. Um, but I'm really happy to talk about it. I think it's really important that we talk about it. Um, I, of course, I am sad that what has happened has happened for those people, for the, for, for the victims of, of, um, of Mike Pilevarchi. But, uh, but I think it is really good that we're talking about it. I think it's really good that things are coming to light and not being hidden. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, we've had this attitude, perhaps even until now, we've had this attitude that safeguarding is the slightly annoying thing that gets in the way of the real ministry of Jesus. And I think what people are realizing is that safeguarding is absolutely at the heart of the ministry of Jesus. So I think it I think it's really good that we are more focused on it, more vigilant about it than ever before. Uh, you know, I run a festival now that's not uh, a million miles different to Soul Survivor in a lot of ways. And it is helping us, you know, to shape a healthier festival, you know, learning some of these lessons and learning from what's gone before uh, in terms of the way we st hold the meetings, but also in the way that we structure the leadership, the way that I, f I find myself in the role that he occupied in, in, in the equivalent organization. Um, so it's helping me to make some real different decisions about, um, you know how I lead, uh, so no, I think it's all really useful stuff. Yeah, and on a national level, um, so it, 
what it by constantly having these conversations kind of reinforces the ideas that we are kind of of the past rather than of the future um so i mean it's an interesting time um and you know a, a dangerous time i guess for the church of england in terms of its future um and, and what comes next but like you say in, and part of me is just like but does it matter like you know it, it, if yeah no i'm not gonna <laughs> say that god god is still in god is still the god of the church um yeah. so whatever happens happens okay well we're talking about god it would be remiss of me if we didn't mention your book um that is uh we were threatening we were abusive in my opinion um the way it was just the way you know we treated them as dirt on your shoe and and, and some people would say well so they should be and to me you'll get no reciprocity from that and <laughs> you'll get nothing back from that so i wanted to change that quite radically and I wanted the offender managers to treat them very firmly, um, to manage them, uh, but to treat them with dignity because they were still human beings. And no human being will relate to being told they're a dirty, horrible, filthy paedophile. They'll never change. They may never change anyway, but they will, you know, they'll never respond to that. So what happened was I I had a boss that I went to and 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 they said, do what it's your department, do what you want. So I changed the way that we managed those individuals or I made provision to change. And I offered people if they wanted to leave the department, they could. And a few did. But I'll tell you what, Alec, you know, when you get a sex offender that rings up the department and asks to speak to their offender manager and says, I've been on a bus today and I can't stop looking at that little boy that travels in front of me and, and, and my, my urges are getting stronger and stronger. Um, help me. You know, when you get that phone call, rather than dealing with that child in the after effect, um, you, you think to yourself, you've got something right. And, and that's how I saw it. I saw that you people, whoever they are, you know, I can't imagine Jesus Christ walking up to anybody and treating them like dirt on his shoe. It, it wouldn't have done it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and um, you you also write. You said that you write about the womb, mm. uh, which obviously uh, for me evokes thoughts towards the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And it, it, forgive forgive my ignorance, but this is is this the first example of this this miracle you know in your historical mm. experience is there anything else that leads yeah. us in this direction at all there are certainly lots of classical myths in which people have anomalous births um so classic one is the goddess hera giving birth to dionysus after eating lettuce and you think lettuce last time i touch a salad again <laughs> but lettuce was was an interesting drug in the ancient world it was seen as aphrodisiac so makes you sexy and anti-aphrodisiac so it kills desire it was both which is really hard for us to take on board and the theory apparently is that because lettuce stems when you break them have a sort of milky fluid that is somehow like semen and that was how the why the ancient greeks thought of lettuces in connection with sexual stuff which is interesting certainly next time you eat a lettuce so there were certainly stories of anomalous births. Um, Jesus is not Bible based, actually. When, when we're accused of being cafeteria Christians, we pick and choose. I'd say the opposite is the case, because if you really are, are authentic to the teachings, then you should be involved in a, in a very different struggle. But yeah, there is this idea. It's also it's become a litmus test for our faith. When I was counseled by all sorts of people, they didn't say to me, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Do you believe Jesus is the son of God and by personal relationship with him, we're saved? They would say, do you believe in it, that gay people can be married? Well, <laughs> what, where did this become the, the, the test of my faith? And so it's actually heretical. It's yeah. heretical. I don't use that term very often, but it's a form of heresy to, to 
to reduce Christianity to this question of where do you stand on this issue? Uh, it, and it's an issue of love. So you should say, I stand with love, which is the teaching yeah, of Jesus. Absolutely. And, and, and another thing... There will be an accommodation between people of different views on this. Um, but I'm well aware that there are many um, uh, with a more conservative position who's... Who, who who would not feel able and, and when I was in Liverpool there were a few who would not feel able for example to share in worship with me or to receive communion at, at my hands and 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 I and I found that painful but I, I I also found I also found it um puzzling really you know that, that quite, quite often people who believe that sort of stuff put their faith in the traditional pronouncements of the church and and in the thirty nine articles, there's an article about the unworthiness of the ministers that doesn't hinder the effect of the sacrament. So you know the 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 view that says you know we will only be with people who are pure, and you're not pure, so we're not going to be with you, uh, didn't feel to me like a particularly traditional view. Um, uh, but those power games, you know, on the general synod, some people join the synod so that they can exercise power. Um, um, some people, like the diocesan bishops of England, are stuck on there, um, um, but 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 others just want to get on there so that they can hear the sound of their own voice in a public forum. Um, uh, not everybody, but some, and and I regret that uh, I regret the approximation of our general synod to Parliament. Um, there's a lot to be said for democracy, but but the 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 downside of a parliamentary system is evident in Westminster, as we'll find out later this week when we all vote. And and it's and it's increasingly evident in the in the life of the Synod. And and I hope therefore that in in the Synod people will be able to pray together, genuinely to pray together, um, um, uh, before they take counsel together. And and that and that we'll be able to live up to what we keep promising is the truth, which is that we are one mm. body in Christ. A conservative, uh, the more conservative evangelical approach to Christianity is is a is a matter of indoctrination, and you talk about your students coming to you to you. Uh, again, you know, I I know a few uh, eighteen, nineteen, twenty year olds in my own house. Um, that they they seem to be up for education, but deeply opposed to indoctrination. And I was wondering uh, if it if you think it comes down to that fundamentally when we're teaching people definitely i think one of the uh, one of the fascinating things with the current generation is that um what we learned you know most of us in our seminaries and in our education where we need to learn the critical engagement with whatever we receive it's something that we learned but this generation right from their childhood they question they don't take anything for granted. They won't take anything and uh, no for an answer. They want to engage. They want to have a debate. They want to, because they have grown up in that free thinking society, particularly uh, in the European context. And also from my own experience, even in uh, what is now called the global South, which is equally technologically exposed to the wider realities of the world. Therefore, I think when we, when it comes to questions of faith and doctrine and uh, and belief, the reason that you know uh, the fact that sixty percent of young people in this country don't want to be part of any organized religion is that because organized religion in very often doesn't allow that debate, doesn't allow that questioning. I'm feeling uh, a bit gloomy, but also, my goodness me, if the church can't see its vocation at a time like this, we might as well give up. You know, there is no point the church having unemployed love. With the water, so the water ran through my fingers and didn't say a thing, just looked me in the eyes and then left. Quite the opposite, actually. They're going to say things that a lot of people might find quite upsetting in the modern age, but there are things that they need to say. And I'd imagine that if you really sort of, you know, walked with them one day and spoke with them, they might say something a bit like this. My great grandfather fought in the First World War. He's in a battlefield in France. 
my grandparents were part of the war effort, serving on the front line, working in munitions factories, um, helping out, driving ambulances. Uh, I remember them making me roast dinners. I remember Sundays in the local pub. Now all I see is people around me who've got no idea about my grandparents. They've gone. Their, their imprints, their, their fingerprints, their footprints in this land that was ours have been covered up by the, the tides of time. The, how soon in the process you knew you were onto something really special? Was it was it quite early or, or no? It wasn't. No, we didn't know um, throughout the whole recording, really. Um, I mean, obviously the band was successful, but I don't think that we really thought it was going to be as, well, we, because we didn't, we had no idea it was going to be as huge as it did. We did silly things in Britain during the riots, you know, get a life. But I actually, um, I, I, um, Jesus is a, is a hero to me and um i um and the message of love thy neighbor is a beautiful one a family tragedy maybe or something in the background that, that's willing them on um and that's always been the case it's always been about identifying with the people who play i think that the thing i mean we lost ray reardon recently now his backstory was extraordinary you know he was buried as a minor he was commended as a policeman all before he turned professional. So he's got this vivid story that is relatable. And I think that's still the case. The game really, really passionate about. Um, but I, I know from my own experience in the Methodist church that change takes time, lots of care and prayer. Um, and so that that's my longing, you know, for the whole church, the whole church of Jesus Christ, Anglicans, Baptists, Roman Catholics, and not just around LGBTQ issues, but, you know, issues, all kinds of, of they're not even issues, are they? Questions of human, um, uh, human life around uh, economic marginalization, around um, migration and immigration, you know, so my own experience as a, as a, as a gay man has I'm I, I, I'm so grateful to be gay. I'm so grateful that God made me gay. Um, I'm so grateful that I'm uh, a recovering alcoholic because in, in those experiences I've come to, I feel like I've been given a little bit more of a lens of what it's like to, you know, um, I don't want to say be excluded because I think that's part of the reality, but a, a, a lens of being seen sometimes as a, as a problem in an institution that I really love. Um, and so uh, my own, um, my own journey is that uh, as a, as a gay man is that my experience is caught up with loads of other folks, um, straight, gay, cisgendered, transgendered, you know, people of every ethnicity and, and race, abled and um, disabled uh, neurodiversity that, that we are all we are all caught up I believe in this wonderful beautiful thing called the kingdom of God mix which we need to come away from as the church yeah. to quote Bono which is something I seem to be in a terrible habit of doing recently because <laughs> he's an interesting character he's, he's he famously saying the God I believe in isn't short of cash you know and neither in fact is the church of England short of cash either no. so to me, where I am, the best that, that the church commissioners have to offer us is a discount on a card reader when they're making a billion pounds a year. That's offensive to me. Yeah. It really is offensive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and people in the estates and the working classes wonder why we do it. You know? Yeah. When you say, oh, I've got to pay whatever it is, 15, 20, 30 grand. What? You, you, where do you get your money from? We get it. We get it from you guys, you know. But I think your point again is really important. You know, priests and and team uh, church teams are working their butts off on these environments. Yeah, in these settings. Yeah, and it know? comes at a massive personal cost, doesn't it? Let's well, be tell honest. Tell me about it, mate. It, tell it, me it's about not it. easy yeah. being a priest anywhere because of what you hear and what you see. But the level of pain and injustice. I I, I got to the point of having to ask some serious questions about what I believed after some of the things that I started to see. You do need to come up with something a bit more than just we're staying where we are. Do you think we are putting too much expectation and pressure on our bishops, Nick? That there is a clear uh, difference of opinion mm. in the House of Bishops as there is in the House of Clergy as in 
the house of laity as there is in the wider church? Are we asking them to solve the unsolvable? I don't think we're expecting enough of our bishops, actually. I think that the House of Bishops made a deliberate political choice in the lead up to February 2023 in General Synod of bringing decisions of things the House of Bishops could do under powers that they already have. So it wasn't General Synod, you know, gives powers to the bishops to do X. The motion we, you and I voted for was this synod welcomes the House of Bishops decisions to introduce liturgy, to replace pastoral guidance. So the House of Bishops have come out and said, our powers are such, we can do these things. And uh, do you welcome us? And we gave the political authority by welcoming that in the February 23 vote, which we reiterated again in November 23 synod. The House of Bishops is charged with leadership and we do need leadership in this area. And I recognize they are in a very difficult position. It's a knife edge that they're walking on because on the one side, they don't want to be seen to be imposing a final final deal on, on everyone. But on the other hand, they're, they're wanting to consult so much. It's almost as if they're saying, well, we can't figure it out amongst ourselves. So let's just get more and more working groups together. Let's have more and more debates at Synod. And hopefully at some point, everyone will agree or something will emerge. I'm not sure if that's the sort of leadership we're at. We've had enough consultation. LLF has been taking place for seven years now. We've had thousands of people in the parishes involved in debating with it. We